and we're just going to settle in and start with the daily word for Palm Sunday. The Christ within protects and clears my way. As I enter Holy Week, I reflect on Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem and how the multitudes greeted him shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Like so many, I have used the sacred time of Lent to cleanse my soul of beliefs and habits that no longer serve me. I have felt blessed as I have opened my heart to the healing, cleansing waters of spirit. Now I feel ready to welcome a greater awareness of the Christ within me. Every part of me quivers with eager anticipation. The world seems fresh and I feel newly alive. I behold the Christ in me and in all others. With joy, I celebrate. With gratitude, I humbly bless the Christ in me and in everyone. And from Matthew, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And we are going to sing the opening song. You're welcome to stand and join in with us. Come, let us gather together. <clears throat> this is a place of love. We come together as people of prayer. This is a house built on love. Come, let us gather in peace. This is a sacred space. We join our hearts here in one loving family. This is a house built on love. We come together as people of prayer. This is a house built on love. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. And um, I just want to apologize. I know last week they didn't have my mic shot off, and I was singing. Oh. <laughs> Man, we know, we know that's a disaster <laughs> right there. <laughs> so I just want to apologize for the intensity of my voice. But anyways, welcome everybody. I'm glad to see family and friends and people that are here for the first time. And everybody out in media land, welcome, welcome. Glad you're here, glad you're joining us. But most of all, I'm really glad that you're feeding your spirit. You know, we feed our, our, our bodies at least three times a day with snacks in between. You know, the least we can do is donate an hour to God on Sunday or we daily or weekly. So it's a beautiful thing. So thank you for being here. Um, now I'd like to have us affirm what we believe in. I think it's really powerful that we do this every week because it's a great reminder. And let us pray it from our hearts as we speak the words. Number one, there is only one presence and one power in the universe and in our lives, God the good. Number two, our essence is of God, therefore, we are inherently good. This God essence was fully expressed in Jesus the Christ. Number three, we are co-creators with God, creating reality through our held in mind. Number four, through prayer and meditation, we align our heart-mind with God. Number five, through thought, words, and actions, we live the truth we know. And so it is. We could say we believe in a lot of stuff, but if our actions aren't in alignment with our words, then people just think we're amiss. You know, we're, we're missing the mark of our spiritual perfection. And we got to practice it. And, you know, one of the greatest commandments of all is wrapped up in this affirmation. Let us affirm together. We are here to love and build our personal relationship with God, to love God with all our mind, heart, and soul, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And so it is. <sighs> now, 
it's time for some prayer requests. Um, first of all, we always want to put the, the church down for, for growth and, and, and resources because we want to attract the right people that in, into our church that are here because they're, they take their spiritual path seriously like all of you do. You know, I've not been in a church quite like Unity Center in Milwaukee. Everyone that's here, you really take your path seriously. You know, you're devoted to your spiritual growth. And, and that's what, one of the great things that I love about this church is to see people, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to learn, I'm going to do my best when I leave here. So I'm, I'm very proud of you, and you all should be very proud of yourselves. Okay? So prayer requests. Yes. Um, uh, from Jean from Prayer Recovery. Jean, healing. Great. Yes. Terry and Marge. Willie. Healing. Yes. Jim for healing. Jim for healing. Yes. Oh, God bless her. It's going to be the most extraordinary experience of her life. That, that is so true. You know, I've been at so many bedsides, and I can't tell you, you know, um, just the little bit that I sense is that is going on in the room, I can't imagine what it's like for the person that's actually experiencing it. And Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross always said it's the most extraordinary experience of our lives because it's our resurrection of our spirit out of our body and into the spiritual realm. I mean, that's, that's incredible. Teresa, and then we got Grandma Barb. <laughs> got you, Cassie. <laughs> it was good, huh? <laughs> yes. Clear mind. What's your mom's name? Julie. 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 Healing of mind, heart, and soul. Yes. Rhoda. Yes, Joanne. World peace. I heard an affirmation um, on my way here to church that I was listening to to this U YouTube um, healing uh, video. And the woman said, I am now at peace with myself and everyone in the world. Is that not beautiful? It's so powerful. So why don't we affirm that together? I am now at peace with myself and everyone in the world. That's really how we're going to achieve world peace. Just imagine if everybody took that time to still themselves and claim their peacefulness and to claim their divinity that I choose to come from my Christ self today. If we just did that one day, I wonder how the world would shift. Isn't that a powerful thought? Maybe it's just powerful for me. Thank you for answering my question. I appreciate <laughs> it. Um, anybody else? Yes. Voting people. And all you women who aren't registered to vote, you get out there and you get yourself registered to vote and vote. And because there were many women who died to give us that right. Can I have an amen? amen. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, yes, Beth. Okay. Hey, they're nice people. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Yeah, 
from now on, we are going to have birthday cake once a month to celebrate all the birthdays in the church and the people we're related to or that we're friends with. Don't you think that's a great idea? Yes. Feed them cake and they will come. <laughs> I do love Costco cake. I, uh, this is my favorite cake. I'm sorry. Somebody said, I asked somebody to go get a Costco cake. Well, can I go? No. No, no jewel cake. No, it's got to be Costco. That is my birthday cake. <laughs> Do they sell half sheets? No, you will get a full sheet. <laughs> what? Oh, is it a half a sheet? I see, all this time I thought it was a full sheet. <laughs> it's still big. <laughs> okay, any more bir uh, birthday wishes? Any more um, uh, prayers? Yes. Uh, Jamie? Jamie? Janie. Clear thinking. I think we all need it. I really do. Clear thinking. You know, um, <laughs> as we move along our spiritual journey, the more we let go of th that... Um, data that we have in our subconscious mind that does not serve us because it, if, if it's not of God and truth, you know, really, how's all that other data serving us to be a much better person or much more for us to express our Christ self? Make sense? Yes. You know, all that judgment, criticism, bad experiences, we can let that go and just have God filter into our minds and our hearts the divine essence of the most powerful light that there is, and that is the illuminous light of God which resides in each and every one of us. And I do ask the spirit of, of life, of wisdom, of, of um, understanding and healing and wholeness that it just penetrates all of these prayer requests, all of the people that are in this church and that God's healing power and presence is upon us and that we continue to build our relationship and knowing that power and that presence within us mainly and all around us. May our eyes be open and our hearts open to that power and that presence. And so it is. Amen. Okay. Music. And then we will move into meditation. I know most of you know this. How could anyone ever tell you you were anything less than beautiful? How could anyone ever tell you you were less than whole? How could anyone fail to notice that your loving is a miracle? How deeply you're connected to my soul. How could anyone ever tell you you are anything less than beautiful? How could anyone ever tell you you are less than whole? How could anyone fail to notice that your loving is a miracle? How deeply you're connected to my soul. Whatever that means to you, where you're sitting, just allow yourself to be open and receptive and responsive to the activity of the Holy Spirit that is here right now. 
amongst us and within us. This is an extremely powerful week. It's known as Holy Week. And the energy of this universe is alive. And it is ready to regenerate each and every one of us in the way that we need to be regenerated in. Just breathe and follow your breath. Allow your body to relax. And just let go. Just feel your shoulders relaxing. Feel your legs and your arms relaxing. This is your private time with God. I also call it the time for holy communication, holy communion. It's our time to speak and to listen to the small, still voice within us that so much wants us to hear what it has to say. Breathe in and exhale out. Breathe in and exhale out. One more time. Just surrender to the power of the presence. Feel the peace of God that is within you and all around you. It's in this state of peacefulness that we find who we truly are. And who are we? We are a beloved child of God, divine heir to the kingdom. But most of all, we are the Christ. That light of God within us is known as our Christ self, the light of Christ. And let this light illuminate our minds, lighting up our minds being open and receptive to the power, to the wisdom, to the divine love of God. Allow yourself to feel it, for that is your true identity the light of God that is the Christ. Right now, just see the doors of your heart opening up, that inner chamber of the Most High, and allow the divine love of light to pour out have it float out to your entire body from the top of your head. See the light. Imagine the light. It's the most gorgeous light you could ever imagine. And then some. This light is guiding you and directing you. helping you to identify who you truly are. Affirm to yourself, I am love. I am love. The purest love of all. The unconditional love.
and now affirm, I am loved. I am loved. so loved the world that he put the begotten son of God in you known as the Christ the daughter of God in you as the Christ his presence loves you unconditionally no matter what you think no matter what you do, this love is unshakable. Now, through experiencing this love and having a consciousness of it within you, I ask for you now to affirm I am loving. I am loving towards myself. And I am loving towards others. made in the image and likeness of God, I am loved. No matter what I do, no matter what I say, from my human self, that this presence of divine love within me loves me. this love in my life by being the most loving person I can possibly be in each moment and each day with each breath that I take I do my best in loving peace be still presence of God. We humbly thank you, dear Lord, for this experience of your power, your presence, and your divine love and wisdom. We are so grateful to have this opportunity to gather into the Christ consciousness together. For it has been said, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. I have no doubts that the presence of God is alive and well within each and every one of you and in this place. And so it is. Amen. Uh, alleluia.
Thank you. And thank you, soundboard team. I appreciate you. Couldn't do it without you. You make me sound better, so that's a blessing. <laughs> so, good morning, everybody. You know, <coughs> we're going to talk in defense of, of Judas. But, you know, I know it's Holy Week, and today is um, Palm Sunday. And it begins with the story of Jesus going to Jerusalem and him telling um, one of his disciples to go get the donkey and, and bring it to him. And so they did. And Jesus rode the donkey into the city of Jerusalem and they threw down palms and they were screaming, Alleluia. I'm sorry, Hosanna in the highest. They probably said Alleluia too. Um, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Metaphysically, what we interpret that as that Jesus was riding above his animalistic energies, forces that is within him. And this is where he is really making a statement that he is now Jesus the Christ. That he is involved totally into the Christ consciousness. When he becomes Christ Jesus, he is the living expression of that consciousness. He's made the entry into the Christ consciousness fully, and then the ascension will be where he is fully active and alive and well and a part of the Christ consciousness. Isn't that incredible? But I sort of wanted to talk about Judas because that poor guy, he's gotten a bad rap. Just a bad rap. I'm telling you, you know, uh, everybody thinks he's a villain. You know, he, he just, you know, how could he betray Jesus? And what is so interesting, if you stop and think about this whole week, there's such incredible energy happening in this universe right now. Because this is a story that is told every year about this time. And it's the most repeated story ever told. Think about it. Just think about that for a minute. You know, we have stuff happen in the news. It comes and it goes. Things happen, you know, in life. They come and they go. And we sort of let it go. But every year, we're talking about Holy Week and what's happening and Good Friday and what Good Friday services are about. And that's about the seven last statements of Jesus. And I'm going to explain on Friday what those statements really mean. Because we can say them, but do we really know what they mean? And why was Jesus saying them? So be here on Friday for that lesson. But Ju Judas is also our life faculty in our body. He's a disciple that represents life. And I just want to read part of the Bible here about the betrayal of, of uh, Jesus. It says, Judas agrees to betray Jesus. Then Judas, the Aristocat, one of the Aristocat. <laughs> oh, my God, is that hysterical? <laughs> yeah, Disney. I went to Disney right away. <laughs> I love that movie, the Aristocats. <laughs> then Judas, the Aristocat, one of the 12 disciples, went to the leading priest and asked, how much will you pay me to betray Jesus to you? And then they gave him 30 pieces of silver. From that time on, Judas began looking at the, an opportunity to betray Jesus. Then we move on to Matthew 17, where the disciples prepare for the Passover. On the first day of the festival of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to prepare the Passover meal for you? And he said, as you go into the city, he told them, you will see a certain man. Tell him, the teacher says, my time has come, 
and I will eat the Passover meal with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus told them and prepared for the Passover meal there. So now they're at the Last Supper. When, I, when it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the twelve. While they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. Now here's the interesting part. All of the disciples asked Jesus, is it me? Is it me? Is it me? Isn't that crazy? Yeah. So, greatly distressed, each one asked in turn, Am I the one, Lord? He replied, One of you who has eaten from this bowl with me will betray me, for the Son of Man must die, as the Scriptures declare long ago. But how terrible it will be for the one who betrays me. He has compassion. He knows who he's, who's going to do it. Don't you think he already knows? He's so in alignment with God. He knows that Ju- this, was, this assignment was given to Judas. And it says it would be far better for the man if he never had been born. Jesus, Judas, the one who would betray him, also asked, Rabbi, am I the one? And Jesus told him, you have said it. In other words, yes. Now, Judas was probably very shocked because Judas was the organizer of the disciples. He was the most level-headed disciple there was. He always made, he took care of the money. He, you know, took care of the, everything for Jesus and all the disciples. So it goes on to say, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, take this and eat it for this is my body. Now he's not literally talking about his physical body. That would be cannibalism, wouldn't it? You know, this is why sometimes we just cannot take things literally in the Bible. When he says, this is my body, what he's talking about is the substance, the energy of God that constantly is expanding. That's what bread symbolizes in the the gospel. It's yeast. It's always expanding. It's always growing. So he says, take and eat this substance, the truth that I have given you, and think about it. Be a part of it. And then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many, Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you and in my Father's kingdom. Now, what if you came over to your family's house and they said, here, here's a glass of my blood, drink it. (laughs) Come on, people. (laughs) Can we really take this literally? There's got to be a little bit more. It's the spirit of the word that we're talking about here, not the letter of the word. And it means to drink my blood. He's talking about his energy, energy. You know, drink my energy. Fill your mind, your heart, your soul. Let see the energy of me running through your veins and your arteries. See the blood of me running through your thoughts, your feelings, you know, every cell and fiber of your being. So we really don't want to eat literally the flesh or to drink blood, do we? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think Jesus would ask that of us. And then they sang a hymn and went out to Mount of Olives. It's an intriguing story, isn't it? And the most talked about story. And why do we talk about it every year? Because I really feel we have to be reminded of what Jesus' ministry was all about. And his ministry was he came to show us the way. He came to give us the truth, to feed us the truth that was going to set us free 
from our, the terrorist thoughts that we have in our own head. Don't we terrorize ourselves sometimes with fear? Why don't we just take fear right there? Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. And then when, you know, um, Jesus was betrayed, Pilate couldn't find anything wrong that Jesus did. Not one thing. And so he sort of throws up his hands and he says, I'll take it to people. So he was not taking on responsibility. And sometimes, you know what? We don't take responsibility for our Christ self either. Pilate knew who he was. I bet you any money he knew who he was. And he didn't want to be blamed. You could take this story and feel it and think about it, percolate it in your head, and, and see what it really means to you. Traditionally, Good Friday is set aside for the religious observance of this event, a time for reliving the pain and the suffering and the shame and the darkness of the crucifixion hour. How many times have we been beaten to death by a church regarding the crucifixion? Yeah, too much. It seems like a lot of people just stop at the crucifixion when there was such a joyous occasion called the resurrection and then the ascension. You know, there's a story about this American English family that was living in China, and they hired this young Chinese woman to take care of their children. But she was just like in such shock and dismay that every room that they went in, she went into, there was the crucifix. Now, the crucifix is different than a cross. The crucifix is where Jesus is all laid out and bleeding all over us, right? You see the suffering. And it really disturbed the calm peace of her soul and the, the, the parents were like, what's wrong, you know? And she sort of put it off for a while. And finally, she, she got up enough nerve that when they did ask her about why, all, she, why, why there was all these crucifixes in their house, and even going up the staircase, there was crucifixes. And she, she's like, why would you want to embed this picture into your children's minds and their hearts. And I mean, I know there's a lot of recovering Catholics out here. And I remember one time being in, in Catholic grammar school and the nun made us look at the clock up on the wall and she made us watch one minute go by. And she said to all of us, one minute that you just experienced is like a hundred years in hell. Why would you say that to a child? We're innocent bystanders. Didn't Jesus say, bring the children on to me? So sometimes, you know, we get a little crazy with these stories. I mean, uh, and what they're really meaning. The Chinese woman who probably, you know, uh, has an Eastern philosophy. She knew about Jesus, and why are we showing the kids this? And why is this nun telling us, you know, it's a hundred day, a uh, hundred days, a hundred years in hell for uh, when we're one minute? That's crazy stuff. That's crazy talk. Do you think Jesus would really want us to experience that? No. No. You know, I don't know. We can all, you know what it boils down to? The freedom of the press. Everybody can read the same book, but since we're all at different consciousnesses in life, we all have a different interpretation of the book. Because we're reading and we're hanging on to what is really meaningful to us, what is striking up our soul. You know, what's setting us on fire with the Spirit of God? 
Oh, you, I mean, we don't have to go about, you know, screaming, you know, Jesus in everybody's face. You know, just allow our actions to be loving and kind and considerate and compassionate and have empathy because that's the way Jesus walked the streets. He went into each town putting a blanket of love and compassion and empathy upon people. But yet he was saying, you are more than this. You are more than this experience. True. Yeah. And we are so much more than our human life. There's a life of God that lives inside of us, and we need to open up the doors. We need to allow that Christ energy to come forth. Let that, that wine of, of, of energy flow through us. And let's set this record straight. Jesus was one of Jesus' closest friends. Jesus believed in him, and he saw great possibilities in him, personally selected him as the one who could be of great help to the cause. And let us never forget that like all the disciples, Judas gave up everything, everything to follow Jesus. And because of his obvious sophistication and intelligence, he may had to give up far more than the others disciples. Isn't that interesting? And he was so devoted to Jesus. And now here's the twister of the whole story. This is where the rubber really hits the road. Judas runs back once he realizes he betrays Jesus with a kiss in the garden. Peter comes along and says, I'll take care of this, and cuts off an ear of one of the soldiers. Okay, we're moving right along. Jesus says, stop, gets the ear, heals the ear. Judas realizes that the kingdom Jesus was talking about was not the kingdom he was thinking about. He thought the kingdom was going to be here on earth and not one of heaven or a heavenly state or a consciousness. Because when we're in that consciousness, it's made manifest out here in our outer world, isn't it? Yeah. Now, he feels terrible. He goes and throws the silver coins back. He can't believe that he got it so wrong. Hasn't there been times in your life <laughs> you go, oh, man, that one's killing me. <laughs> you know, and it takes us so long to forgive ourselves. And sometimes we do feel like, oh, my God, I wish I could kill that part of, of me that did that. You know, kill it off. But, you know, he hung himself because he loved Jesus dearly. And he never meant Jesus any harm. He was only pushing his agenda. Judas was really pushing his agenda for Jesus instead of trusting that Jesus was in charge, he was in tune to God, and things were going to be okay. It was part of the destiny. Because in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, Father, pass this cup from me if it is your will. And the cup symbolizes the experience. Now, don't you think that if Jesus wanted to get out of this, he'd go to the Father and said, send your angels and have them straighten it all out? That they would all descend onto earth and make it right? That's the power Jesus had. And that's also the power of God that's inside of us. We might have to ask, God, send me some angels to get myself out of this mess. Dear God, help me. You know, send your angels of inspiration. Now, angels are very symbolic of inspirational thoughts. That's what they are in the Bible. Inspirational thoughts. Yeah. 
It's a powerful story. It's one of my favorite stories in the New Testament. It's the favorite time of year. And really, it's not for the chocolate. <laughs> you know, my mom used to make up some good Easter baskets. It was all with Fannie Mae candy. It was good. It was good stuff. And Judas was the most talented. He was the most educated, the most businesslike of all the disciples. Why did he pick Judas? Because he knew Judas was organized and he had a plan for everything and he was going to do it. He was going to make Jesus do what he thought Jesus should have done. And that's our, you know, that's the part of this story that we don't really understand because we've been made out to think that Judas was a villain. But if we believe everything is happening for a reason and a purpose, so was that. Judas really thought that Jesus was going to make the kingdom right there when he gave him the kiss. I can't imagine how mortified he must have felt. You know, in the final hours, though, he had been certain he would never do do so. Now, then we got Peter. Peter, I would, uh, you know, he tells Jesus, you know, I would never betray you. <laughs> Jesus says, now this tells you how much Jesus really knows, right? Peter, the disciple of faith, right? You are going to betray me three times before the crow, before the, yeah, the crow crows three times. You were going to betray, betray me three times. I would never do that, Jesus. I would never do that. <laughs> well, we sell ourselves the same story, too, you know. <laughs> but anyways, but I just want to give you food for thought. I really want you to know that there is more to this story than just the words. And, you know, Jesus says on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, there's another misinterpretation, and we'll find out more about that on Friday. And really, what uh, George Lamza, he, he was a Bible scholar, and he says what Jesus really meant when he was saying was that was, my God, my God, for this I was kept, I am fulfilling my destiny. Whole different perspective, isn't it? And then here's something I want you to think about between now and next Sunday, which is Easter. Jesus being so highly developed spiritually and being the Christ essence in him. Don't you, and here he, one of his last healing acts was to put the man's ear back on, the soldier's ear back on. Don't you think Jesus could have come off the cross? But he was fulfilling his destiny. He came to show us the way. It's like I said last week, get off the cross. We need the wood, folks. We need the wood. Give up the cross. And then next week, we're going to talk about how Jesus didn't die on the cross. What do you think of that? <laughs> what? What, Reverend Betty? What are you talking about? And I got biblical stuff to back it up. Yeah. So now I know we're all healing from our old thoughts and patterns about Judas, aren't we? Thank God. Thank God we have the opportunity to think again. Isn't it? It's a beautiful thing. What a gift. So I'm going to say, and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Until next week. <laughs> or Friday. Then we go to Friday. Friday and then Sunday. So be here. I mean, it's fascinating. You know, I, I just think that the Easter story is the story of hope, regeneration, renewal. 
I believe a lot of healing is going on in the planet right now. Um, people that even just get a glimpse of the light of God or a feeling of God, they're being transformed right now. This is the season. This is the season for change. This is the season for rebirth. This is the season when all the flowers come up out of the ground because they've been in darkness all winter. Oh, the top, um, Beth says when you leave, make sure you see the flowers blooming out in front of the church. And we do need a garden committee. If you have any extra flowers that you want to bring to the church that multiplies, I'm sure that Diane would just love that. And we can plan them. But remember, you're being reborn every day. In fact, I think we're all being reborn with every breath we take. So now it's time for our offering. All of God's people said, amen, again. <laughs> yeah, I didn't hear you. Let's do that again. And all of God's people say, amen. Remember, when we say amen, we're saying, I accept the truth that sets me free. I accept the truth. I accept the truth. Okay. So put that offering in your hand and bless it. Just bless it. And let us affirm together that God is our only source and supply. Together. I have faith in God as my instant, constant, and abundant supply. I have faith in God to open new ways where human senses there is no way. I have faith in God to guide, govern, and direct me in God's services. I have faith in God to raise my human consciousness to divine intelligence for a higher understanding. I have faith in myself as a child of God, eager to do work for God. And so it is. Amen. We got a little song, music. Yes, come on up. Come on, Susan. Come on, Susan, our artistic woman. I've missed you too. Thank you, Susan. I miss you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, what song do we have here? Mm. The song I wrote this week called Faces of Grace. Mm.
Wow. Thank you, Susan. Susan's one of the most gifted artists I've ever seen, you know? She can paint, she can do uh, beautiful writing. Um, she's silly. She's silly, we like her silliness. I mean, just anything artistically, this woman can do it. You know, my wish is that when when I die and come back, and if I have to come back to planet Earth, I really want to come back with the voice of Tina Turner. <laughs> Just so you guys know, because I got no voice for singing this, this, this round. All right, Tina. Tina, I love Tina. What a woman. But anyways, let's do the blessing of givers. We want to thank each and every one of you. You know, may God's grace fall upon your mind, your heart, your souls, your lives. For you are the mighty vessels for you to give of God's resources that have come to you to help feed this church, Unity Center in Milwaukee. I ask that each and every one of you are, are blessed and you are encouraged with the wisdom of God. And may you always feel the, the mighty, mighty, unconditional love of God. And so it is. Amen. Now we have some, uh, just a few announcements. Potluck, that's today after service. We got birthday cakes, big birthday cakes. <laughs> I show, uh, showed Ollie, and he was like, <laughs> like that, in front of the cake because he just thought it was huge, and I said, it is. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, healing and connecting power of music, Catherine Rambo, Julie Thompson, da Doug Esty, and friends, April 27th, 9.30 to 4 uh, 50 in advance, 55 at the door. For information, a brochure is available by the bulletin board. I'm sure there's also some in the um, where we uh, the community room. Next Friday, join us for Good Friday services at 6:30. We're going to uh, discuss the seven last statements of Jesus. Easter Sunday is at 10 a.m. You know, um, you know, we used to call them Christers. Christers. Those are the people who come to church only on Christmas and Easter. <laughs> so if you have any Easter friends that are looking for a church to come to, because it's one out of the two that they come to, tell them to come on down. We'd love to see them. We'd love to love on them, okay? And now let's stand and sing, Let There Be Peace on Earth. Sing it loud, sing it proud. Let's do it.
God surrounds us. The love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. The presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is, and all is well. Cha-cha. Thank you so much.